my sermon, if you're writing down notes, is entitled Today. And as we've been looking at this story of God calling His people back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple, and we've been looking at that as a metaphor for evangelism, the work of having that place where God's presence can be so that people can get to know who God is. This morning, I want us to go back into that story, and I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Haggai, and Haggai chapter 1, and Last time that we were together, Haggai chapter 1 and verses 1 and 2, we talked about how discouragement had stopped the work and how discouragement can come into our lives and how discouragement comes about as we lose sight of God, that the people had truly been led by God in their experience to come out of Babylon and to be there and to rebuild the temple but because of losing sight of God, when difficulties came, they became discouraged. And we find that the people were saying, as we read here in Haggai chapter 1, and verse 1 and 2, In the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, saying, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, The time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be rebuilt. And there's two things that I want to talk about first. The first thing is that they had become discouraged, and that discouragement led them to the point where, although they had clearly seen God working in their experience, they said, No, all of these difficulties mean that God is not with us when we found that God brings us into difficulties so that we can actually grow. He brings us into difficulties so that we can overcome them, so that we can learn to be better workers for Him. And He promises that He is with us, and as we trust Him, our faith grows as well. Then we see God do impossible things like what we read in Matthew, where He says, um, when the fig tree was withered up, and, and they said, Master, how do you do this? And Jesus said, uh, if you pray, if you believe, you can tell this mountain to move. And Jesus actually gets that from the story of rebuilding the temple in the book of Zechariah, where you have these two brass mountains that are in the way of the work being done. God brings us into difficulties, not because He's not there, but because He is there, and He wants to use those difficulties to grow and to build our character. But here, the people had gotten discouraged, and so they had stopped building. The second thing that I want you to notice is that they had said that the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. And I want to talk about that for a moment. What was the whole reason why God had brought them out of Babylon some 19 years ago? Why had He brought them out in the first place? It was to build that temple. But they lost sight of the purpose of the temple. And I think that we often lose sight as well. And I want you to just journey with me for a few moments. You can write these down. I'm just going to read them because there's a lot of them. You can write these texts down. But we find in Scripture that God's purpose has always been, I want to be with you. That's, that's, his, that's what he's all about. I want to be with you. I want to, I want to you know, I want to stay in your house. You know, to use a more contemporary word, I want to hang out with you. I want to be in your life. From the very beginning, that's what it's always been about, and that's how it's always going to be in the new heavens and the new earth. God wants to be with you. Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, the Bible says, They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. God came to be with Adam and Eve in their presence. Exodus chapter 25, verse 8, Let them construct a sanctuary for me that I may dwell among them. That's what God wanted to do. God brought them out of Egypt, said, let's make a temple, a place where I can stay, and my presence is going to be right there in the midst of you. Leviticus chapter 26, verses 11 and 12, the Bible says, moreover, I will make my dwelling among you, and my soul will not reject you. 
I will also walk among you and be your God, and you will be my people. Again, we see this. The reason for the sanctuary or the temple or the tabernacle is that God wants to live in your life. And if God has brought you, as we'll talk a little bit about in a moment, if God has brought you out of Babylon, He didn't bring you out of Babylon to forget the reason why He brought you out of Babylon. He brought you out of Babylon so that He can be in your life. You follow me? But what happens when we forget why God brings us out? What happens is, as we'll see in a little while, is that our priorities get misplaced. And we start living for something other than the reason why God brought us out. Does that make sense to you? The Bible tells us again, Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 26 and 28. I will make a covenant of peace with them. It will be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them. And I will set my sanctuary in their midst forever. My dwelling place also shall be with them. And I will be their God. And they will be my people. And I want you to notice how those two things always go together. Because when we forget why God brings us out of Babylon, we lose sight that He is our God. When we lose sight of the presence of God, those two things are gone. His presence, His purpose. I want to be there with you. And when we forget why He brought us out, then something else will take the place of God. And it happens to all of us. When we're not living for the purpose for which he brought us out, something else, it may be deceptive, it may creep in, it may be very, it may look very, I don't know what the word is, very benign. But something else is going to take the place of God. We are no longer in covenant relationship with him. An aside here. Every time God raises up a prophet, it's because he's calling people back into a relationship with himself. Did you know that? Every time, you just read the scriptures, the Old Testament prophets were always calling people back to God. If God gives us a prophet today, it's because God is calling people back to him. Why does he need to call people back to him? Because people have broken relationship with him. And we really do need to realize where we are today. Going back, the Bible tells us here, going on, my dwelling place also shall be with them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people, and the nations will know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them when my sanctuary is in their midst forever. Something happens in your life that people around you can see. Did you hear that? Notice what it says again. The nations, that's the non-Jewish people, the people who don't know the God of heaven. And the nations will know that I am the Lord who sanctifies Israel. Other people will know that God is working in your life when? When my sanctuary is in their midst forever. But the problem is they're not building the sanctuary. They've come to the point where they've gotten discouraged and they've stopped doing what God brought them out of Babylon to do. So if that happens, then can the people around them know who God is? And we have to like, we, we have to be honest and we have to say, you know, I'm not just up here preaching a sermon. God's word is, is, is real and it's speaking. Listen, people won't know who God is or somebody else, and I, and I mean this in the most respectful way, but somebody else is going to go out and share a half-sided view of God, an incomplete picture of God. Why has God given us, and we're not better than anybody else, but why has God given us a message for the last day? Because we have a pretty good, complete picture. We don't know everything. Me and my wife were talking this morning in the car. We don't know everything about God, but what He has revealed, God's revealed a lot of things to this church. 
and we have a fairly good understanding of the great controversy and the nature and the character of who God is. We have a, 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 a fairly good understanding of how the law and grace go together in the big picture of the character of God and what's going on behind the scenes and what's going to happen in the last days. We don't just know what the mark of the beast is. We know how it all fits together. Does that make sense to you? And so if we fail to do our work, yes, God is going to use somebody else, but they're not going to have a complete picture of who God is. God wants people to know who He is. And so He says, And the nations will know that I am the Lord who sanctifies Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forever. When God's presence, when His purpose for bringing us out of Babylon is revealed, His presence in our lives. Matthew 1, 21. She will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means, everybody knows what it means. What does it mean? God with us. Here, God is fulfilling His purpose of walking with men. And who does He do it through? He does it through Jesus Christ. John 1, 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The, the Greek word skene is tabernacle. He tabernacled with us. And what happens when God's tabernacle is with us? And he dwelt among us, and we saw his glory. What does God reveal in his sanctuary, in his tabernacle, in his presence? He reveals his glory, his character. Jesus came to show the world what God is like. Does that make sense to you? And when we cooperate with God in the work which he brought us out of Babylon to do, which is work on building the temple, it's so that God's glory, His character, can be revealed, so that people can see that it's God who is transforming your life. Why do you have peace in the midst of the storm? Why do you have peace when sickness comes? Why do you have peace when it looks like your life is falling apart? How do you get taken care of when it looks like there's no money? How is it that you have this experience. It's because there's a God who's real and He's active in my life, and He can be active in your life as well if you desire it. He's doing that so that people can know who He is when they see Him in our lives. Amen? Yeah? The Bible tells us Matthew chapter 18 and verse 20. For where two or three have gathered in my name, I am there in their midst. Again, God just simply revealing throughout the whole Bible, what I want to do is I want to be in your life, and when I'm in your life, my glory, my character is being revealed. You know, Jesus says, let your light so shine among men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. As they can see the work of Christ in your life, God transforming you, they glorify God. Again, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 22, the Bible says, In whom you also are being built together into a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Revelation 21, verse 3. Again, from Genesis all the way down to Revelation, here's what it is. And I heard a loud voice from heaven, from the throne, saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, is with men, King James, and He will dwell among them, and they shall be his people. And God himself will be their God. Uh, the New American says, be among them. God wants to live with us forever. That's what it's all about. And his presence in our life transforms us. It changes us. There's no way that we can walk in a covenant relationship with God and not be transformed. That's what it's all about. God wants to turn all of us into little pictures of who Jesus is. 
places where God's presence dwells, places where God's glory is seen and revealed. So the first thing that we want to talk about this morning is the fact that they had lost sight of that. They lost sight of the reason why they were called out of Babylon. And I have to ask you the question, have we lost sight of the purpose of God in calling us out of whatever previous life we were living? Which brings me to my next point, which is the past versus the present. They had come out of Babylon. They had experienced the stirrings of God in their life. As a matter of fact, I want you to notice, I want you to notice what the Bible says in Ezra chapter 1 and verse 5. Ezra chapter 1 and verse 5. And I want you to think about this. Ezra chapter 1, verse 5. We have 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah. Ezra chapter 1, verse 5. When we're there, can we say amen? Amen? I heard, I heard like three amens. Ezra chapter 1 and verse 5. Okay, we ready? Amen. This was their experience. Ezra chapter 1, verse 5, Then the heads of the fathers' houses of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites, with all whose spirits God had, what everybody? What does it say? What does your text say? Had raised, mine says moved, some says stirred. Have you ever experienced God stirring your heart? Did you experience God stirring your heart in the past? When you came up out of Babylon, did you experience God moving upon your heart and you said something like, this is the truth. I'm going to follow this. I see God moving in my life. I'm going to walk where he's leading. Have you ever had that experience? Yes? Uh, question, are you experiencing that today? That's the thing. See, they had come up out of Babylon. They had experienced the stirring of God 19 years ago. But today, they're not experiencing it because they're not doing the work that God had told them to do. So it's not enough for what we've experienced in the past. That's the point that I want to make. The past versus the present. It's not enough that God stirred my heart some time ago. It's not enough some time ago I gave my heart to God. That's not enough. What matters is, where am I today? And if I'm in the process of building the temple, well then, good. But if I'm not, then that's, that's saying something. That's saying that I might as well still be where I was because I'm not in this walking relationship with God in my midst or I'm not seeking that. I'm not seeking to have that temple being built experience so that I can have God's presence in my life. I've somehow either gotten discouraged and left off the work, and I'm okay with that. The past is not enough. People experience the moving of God, the stirring of His Spirit in their life, but it's not enough when it's in the past. We need that experience today. And God was trying to do that, and God is actually trying to do that literally today. How do we know? Because God's Word is a, is a present tense thing. As a matter of fact, turn with me in your Bibles, and I was going to look at this text later, but I feel impressed to look at it right now. Go with me in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. When we're there, can we say amen? Hebrews chapter 3 and verses um, 7 and 8. Are we there? Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7 and 8, the Bible says here, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, when? Today, if you hear His voice. Notice that the listening to God is a what kind of tense experience? It's a present today experience. It's not what I heard 19 years ago or 20 years ago or five years ago or two years ago or three months ago. It's what am I hearing today? Do I hear God calling me today? Am I obeying Him today? Is He stirring my heart today? Am I 
obeying by working today? Am I building the temple today? Or have I gotten discouraged and left it off? He says, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. God's word is focused on today, the stirring of our hearts today. Not when he moved on my heart 19 years ago when I left Babylon. Because if I stopped working, again, let's go back to this point. If I've stopped working on building the temple, then I might as well still be where I was. Do you follow me? I might as well still be where I was lest Satan end up using us, unawares, as false models of what Christ calls people to be. Maybe you've heard that saying where Ellen White talks about how Satan's best tool is a half-hearted Christian. Because it's deceptive. Because it looks good looks good. And it says, well, okay, if that's what a Christian is, then I can follow that example. But that example isn't having a daily living experience with God, and so people get self-satisfied. And if that's what it, all that it has to be, well, then I can do that as well. And so we might as well be. And so Jesus says, I wish, or I would, thou wert cold, or what, everybody? Or hot. But because thou art neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 18, not only had they experienced the, the stirrings of God in the past, but as we've already said, or I've alluded to several times, they came out of Babylon in the past. Revelation chapter 18. Revelation chapter 18 Verse 1 through 4, the Bible says, or 1 and 2, After these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. Verse 4, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins and you receive her plagues. God is, is, has in the past called us up out of Babylon, and we came in the past. We left. And what did we leave when we left Babylon? Babylon is a symbol of pride. We read in Isaiah chapter 14 where the king of Babylon says, I will be like the Most High. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I, 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 etc. In the story of King Nebuchadnezzar where is not this great Babylon which I have built by the might of my power and for the name of my glory. That's what Babylon represents. And we, we made a stand. I am going to leave all that is selfish and all that is self-assertive and all that is prideful. And we came out of that in the past, but where are we today? Again, it doesn't matter what we left in the past if we've gone back to it in the present. Because God is always calling for a today experience. When God raises up a prophet... Like Haggai, he's calling them back into a relationship with himself. The people, if you read the story in Haggai, the people are, and we'll look at it, they're building their houses, and some of the language is language of luxury. That's what they've gone back to. In Babylon, they trust in wealth and power. You read Revelation chapter 18. You read Jeremiah. Babylon was a golden cup. It was the golden city. Revelation 18 talks about the wealth and the ships and the merchantmen and all of the things that Babylon has. And we decided to leave the God of money and wealth in power. And we come out of that. But again, where are we today? Babylon symbolizes that, that mentality of saving myself. Remember the Tower of Babel? 
let us build us a tower and make us a name and a tower whose top can reach to heaven so that if another flood came, they would be able to save themselves. And we left that, that dependence on me, and we come to that realization, only Jesus saves. But where am I today? Does my life reflect, not my words, not my theory, does my life reflect only Jesus saves? Does my life reflect that today? Because it doesn't matter if it reflected it in the past. Remember, as we're reading the story of Haggai, they're not building the temple. They've come to the point where they said, now the time to rebuild the Lord's house, that time has not come. Babylon represents the systems that reject God's word. As you read Revelation chapter 18, Babylon is guilty of the blood of the prophets. You read Matthew chapter 23, in the last few verses, Jesus says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that stonest the prophets, killest them that are sent unto you. It was the same experience where God sends his word and people reject that word. And they don't like that word. And so we left in the past everything that was a rejection of God's word. And we said, this is the truth. I'm going to walk in it. I see the Sabbath. I'm going to walk in that. I see. I understand what happens to a man when he dies. I'm going to walk in that. I, I know what God wants of my body. I'm going to walk in that. I see what God wants of my time and my money. I'm going to walk in that. I, I see the big picture about the law of God and grace. I'm going to walk in that truth because it was truth. But are we still following truth today? Do we have in our mouths, where, so we're saying with our mouths, yes, I believe in the truth and I, I accept the truth, but as Jesus says, you know, they honor me with their words, but their hearts are far from me. Where are we today? Do you follow me? It's today. Where am I today? What's my experience with God today? Am I building today? Not what I started doing in the past, because uh, the next point is that they had laid down foundations. They did. They laid down an altar, and they laid down the foundations of the building. And, and if you turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews, and we look at some of these foundations, it is not sufficient in the past to have experienced repentance. It's not sufficient in the past to have accepted Christ as our personal Savior. It is today that matters. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 1 through 3. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1 through 3. The Bible says, Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance, from dead works and faith toward God of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of the resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. Those foundations may have been laid in the past. But what are we doing with them today? Are we building on them today? Ephesians tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. It's good that in the past we accepted these things. But what are we doing with them today? It's good that in the past the altar was built because they experienced that. They did all of those things. They Heart, their hearts were stirred. They came up out of Babylon. They came back to Jerusalem, and they were very excited and enthusiastic about it. They built the altar and reestablished the sacrificial services. They laid down the foundations and rejoiced. But then they got discouraged to the point where they said, the time that the Lord's house should be rebuilt has not come. 
The past is not sufficient today if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart. And then the end result is that their priorities got shifted. Their priorities in the past were the right priorities, but their priorities in the present are twisted. And we may have had our priorities in the right place in the past, but where are my priorities today? Are my priorities twisted? Again, if I'm not building and God's sanctuary is not there, if that's not my purpose, if I've lost sight of the purpose for which he's brought me out, I told you something else is going to take the place of God. And so while we may live in the land, and while we may profess the name of Israel, something else is going to be our God. Because unless we're in a living covenant relationship with God today, then something else has supplanted the place of Jesus. For Israel, wealth, home, luxury, their own lives had supplanted the place of God. They still talked about the God of heaven, but he was not really their God. Are you hearing me? Yeah? So while we may talk about the God of heaven, unless we're actually living out the purpose for which he called us out, then something has supplanted the God of heaven in our life. How do I know that? Let's go in our Bibles to Haggai. Haggai chapter... Haggai chapter 1. And verse 2 through 4. Haggai chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. The Bible says here, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, the, This people says, The time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses? Sealed, sealing, it means like, it's basically, it, it means one of two things. It means that God's house, and you look at the original structure of Solomon's temple, had, had cedar paneling, and then it was covered with gold. He says, so the house of God should have that, but you're putting all of your effort to doing that into your house. But it could also be a sign of luxury. You're making your house really, really, really nice. The Bible says here, it says, is it time for you yourselves? And there's an emphasis there. That's the, uh, the Hebrew is emphasizing you. You, is it time for you? What about me? That's the emphasis. Is it time for you to be living how you want? What about me? Who called you out of Babylon? Who stirred your heart? Who brought you salvation? Who gave you the truth of atonement and peace and forgiveness? Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses? Notice the contrast. And this house, temple, to lie in ruins? See the contrast there? Is it time for you to be living about your things, but what about, why did I call you out? What was the whole reason for me bringing you out? To come and build me a temple so that I can live in your midst, but what are you focusing on? What does it say? You and your house. Because of discouragement, they lost focus for the reason for the temple and why they had left Babylon, and they were now in the present focused on their own lives. God had been lost sight of, and now they were living for mammon, serving money. And you say, how, how do you get that from, how are they serving money? Friends, let me, let me show you something. Haggai chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. The outplaying of this, says that something had supplanted God. The Bible says in verses 9 through 11, are we ready? 
Verse 9 through 11, the Bible says, You looked for much, but indeed it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Listen, I blew it away. Why, says the Lord of hosts, because of my house that is in ruins while every one of you runs to his own house. Notice how their priorities are misplaced. Then listen to what he says here. This is the key. Therefore, the heavens above you withhold the dew, and the earth withholds its fruit. For I called for a drought on the land, and on the mountains, and on the grain, and on the new wine, and the oil, on whatever the ground brings forth, on men and livestock, and on all the labor of your hands. Did you hear what God said? He says, because you're living for yourself, now I am punishing you, chastising you. We'll see why he does this in a moment. But I'm chastising you. The heavens are not giving their what they give. The ground is not giving what it gives because I'm at work there in your life. And let me tell you why I'm doing that. Turn with me in your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 11. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 13 through 17. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 13 through 17. Are we there? Amen? Deuteronomy 11, 13 through 17. Listen to this. And it shall be that if you earnestly obey my commandments, which I command you, when? Today. To love the Lord your God and serve Him with all of your heart and with all of your soul, then I will give you the rain for your land in its season, the early rain and the latter rain, that you may gather in your grain and your new grass in your fields for your livestock, that you may eat and be filled. Notice God says, listen, if you'll obey me, I'm going to give you everything that you need. What then can we assume is not happening in Haggai? Disobedience, and what shape does it take? If you will earnestly obey my command, which I command you to love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul, what are they not doing? If we're not building, friends, what are we not doing? We're not loving God. If we're not loving God, what kind of relationship are we in? Or maybe we could use the language in Revelation. You have a name that you live, but you're dead. And I'm not throwing this at you. I'm speaking to myself as well. We're just talking about realities. We need to know. Because God's word, when it's, when it's spoken, he's wanting to draw us today back to himself. So he says, now, now go on with me. Look at what he says. Take heed to yourselves, verse 16, lest your heart be what? Deceived and you turn aside, and that's always a, that's a technical language for going to somebody else, and that you turn aside and you serve other gods and worship them, lest the Lord's anger be aroused against you, and he shut up the heavens so that there be no rain, and the land yield no produce, and you perish quickly from the good land which the Lord your God has given you. What's happening in, in the story of Haggai? Is the Lord giving the rain? What have they done? They've turned aside. Now, now we know that they didn't turn aside to any physical idol. We know that. But friends, we don't need to turn aside to any physical idol, do we? And again, with all respect, I don't need to become a Buddhist in order to turn away from God, do I? No? I don't have to turn away from something that is an idol. I'm sorry, I don't have to turn to something that is a physical idol in order for me to turn aside from God. As a matter of fact, I can have my name in the church and have turned aside from God. And that's exactly where they were. Something else had taken the place of most importance. My house and my glory and my presence has been lost sight of, and you're focused on you and your life and what you're going to eat and what you're going to drink and what you're going to wear 
etc. That's where they were. And it happens by degrees. It didn't start out at once. I'm going to preach maybe next week the importance of what happened when they laid the temple, how our words can discourage and have a long-term effect. It's powerful and sad. But that's what happened. By degrees, they lost sight of it. And they became discouraged, and they stopped. And so God, in His love, sends a prophet. And I, I'll repeat that again. When prophets are sent, it's to call people back into a relationship with Himself. That's a God of love. Just, just that right there. A prophet means God loves you. You know that? For He is merciful. For His mercy endureth forever. A God of faithfulness and loving kindness and truth. That just having a prophet says God loves you because he's not simply saying, hey, you're going to be lost if you don't listen to me, but he's calling us out of our lostness into life. A prophet means there's a relationship and a, and a, and a call to life. Amen? The Bible says as we start bringing this to a close, turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Matthew. So they had turned aside from God to the God of self and mammon, the God of houses and lands, the God of eating and drinking, the God of luxury. In Matthew chapter 16, I'm oh, sorry, Matthew chapter 6, I'm trying to keep this not too long. Matthew chapter 6. I'm waiting for the day when I says, try not to keep it too long, and somebody says, preach. <laughs> and I'll say, okay, you forced me. Okay, Matthew chapter 6 and verse, <laughs> verse 19, uh, verse 24. Are we there? Uh, actually, verse 19. The Bible says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures where? Treasures on earth, notice where, where the focus is that Jesus is dealing with. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Question, where was their heart? here on earth, in their own, my circle, my bubble. That's where it was at. And it's not to say, friends, let's be real, it's not to say that they, that they had no desire to do the work. But the desire wasn't strong enough to seek the Lord for help to do it. So instead of speaking, hey guys, maybe the time has come, let's just, let's just push a little bit harder, they were all starting to just mumble and grumble. You know, maybe the time hasn't come. That was the general, because it says, this people, plural, says. Not one or two, not the leaders, but this people in general says. That was the general attitude. And maybe the people should have started saying, hey, hey guys, you know what? God called us out for something. Let's do something. Just like it only takes one or two voices to start spreading discontent, let's maybe one or two voices saying, hey, no, let's work. Let's do it. Let's get together. Let's focus. The Bible says going on in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, No man can serve two masters. He will either hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon, the idol of money. Remember Deuteronomy, lest you turn aside to another god and worship and serve them, and then the heavens be shut up. And that's where they are. And it's not this, like, money is everything to me, but it was deceptive so that they didn't even know that money had become the focus of their life. And it could happen to us. And, and that's the thing. None of us are out there saying, no, I'm, I want to worship money, or I want to worship this, or my job, or my education, or my lands, or whatever. None of us say that. My car, school, none of us say that. But it happens and the fact that we turn aside 
and, and we lose sight of what we've been called to says that it does happen. Do you follow me? It happens. And so Jesus is going on in verse 25, Therefore I say unto you, do not worry about your life. You see, when money becomes the main issue, it's because you're worrying about what? Your life. That's why he says, Therefore I say unto you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. And you can read in, in Haggai where it says, that that's what they were focusing on. The Bible says, going on, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father, what? Feeds them. Are you not more value than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? Notice verse 32. For after all these, who? The Gentiles. People who don't know the God of heaven are looking for that stuff. So what does it say about the kind of mindset that the children of Israel are in in Haggai's day? They're like Gentiles. They might as well still be in Babylon because it didn't matter what God did for them in the past. It mattered what was happening in the present. And it's not so much about what we've experienced in the past. Let those, be, let those be guiding lights. Let those be markers on the path. But let them not become the monument where we stay. Do you follow me? Let's keep moving. He says, because that's what the Gentiles seek. Because your heavenly Father knows you need all these things. But seek what? Notice priorities. Are we there? Verse, 30, verse 33, but seek first. That's the priority. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then, and that's exactly what Haggai is telling them. Put God first, obey, and then God is going to do everything else that you're asking for. Let me show you that as we close. Go with me in your Bibles to Haggai chapter, chapter 1. That's exactly what God is saying. Put your priorities today in the right place. Because the difficulties that you are experiencing are due to your failure to remember why I called you out in the first place. The Bible tells us here in Haggai chapter 1, notice what it says here in verse 5. Now thus, now therefore thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways, okay? You have sown much and bring in little, that's their focus on food. You eat, but you do not have enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put it in a bag with holes. So what does God say? Put your focus in the right place. Verse 7, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways, reflect. Reflect. He says it twice in verse 5 and verse 7. Reflect about your present tense situation. Where am I today? Friends, God is calling us today. Reflect. Where am I today? Verse 8, go up to the mountain. This is seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. And we'll talk about this at, again at another time. But what does he say to do? Obey me. Put your priorities in the first place. You've been focused on your eating and your drinking and what you're wearing, etc., and your home. Build my home where my presence can be, where my glory can be reflected in your life, where people can see who I am working in 
you. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Then all of this other stuff that you're looking for, your food and your clothing and your shelter, it will be added unto you. How do we know that? Look at this here in verse, in verse 12. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, etc., obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people feared the presence of the Lord. Then Haggai the Lord's messenger spoke the Lord's message to the people, saying, I am with you. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, and then dropped down with me to chapter 2. And look at what it says here in verse 8, 15. Are we ready? And now carefully consider from this day forward, from before stone was laid upon stone in the temple of the Lord. Since those days, when one came to a heap of 20 ephahs, there were but 10. When one came to the wine vat to draw out 50 baths of press, there were but 20, meaning that the, the curse was on you. I struck you with blight and mildew and hail in all the labors of your hands, yet you did not turn to me, says the Lord. And that's another subject. But consider now from this day forward, now that you've started building, now that you've obeyed, now that you're laying stone upon stone, now that you've gone up to the mountain to get wood and build my house, now consider from this day forward, from the 24th day of the ninth month and from the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider it. Is the still, seed still in the barn? As yet the vine and the fig tree, the pomegranate and the olive tree have not yielded their fruit. But from this day I will what? I'll bless you. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then what? All this other stuff that you've been focusing on, I'll add that to you. Put me at the center of your life. And then all of that stuff that you think you need, I'll give that to you. I'll take care of you. But it all comes down to this. Where are my priorities due to what do I think that God has called me out for? Let me repeat that again. Where are my priorities, priorities today due to my understanding of why God called me out of Babylon in the first place? Have I forgotten why he called me out? Have I forgotten what he called me to do? Have I forgotten that it's about him and building his house, or am I focused on my life? Because when we lose sight of him and what he called us out for, something else is going to be our God. So you have to ask the question to yourself reflect today what is my God? What's the thing that is most important to me today? If today was Sunday or Monday, what would be the most important thing for me today? School, work, what would it be? Home, house, family, what would it be? God calls us to consider our ways. Think about where we are. Because in his love, God speaks today. If you will hear my voice today, if I'm saying this to you today, it's because I'm calling you today. Get back into a relationship with me today. I'm not telling you so that you feel bad and you feel lost and hopeless. No, I'm telling you so that you can seek me. And as you choose to reflect and understand your situation and say, yes, Lord, I give my heart to you. God begins to stir your heart. And you take action, because it's not enough to approach him with a yes, Lord, where my heart is far from me, for, from him. Like the son, you remember the parable of the two sons? 
son, go out and work in my vineyard today. No, I'm not going. And the other said, yeah, I'm going. The one that said, yeah, I'm going, what? Didn't go. <laughs> their word, they honor me with their words, but their hearts are far from me. But the one who said, no, I'm not going, was repentant. And what did he do? He went. Which one of those two did the work of the father? The one that went. And that's what God is asking us to do. Reflect and act. Because he gives grace to do it. I will stir up your hearts. I will be with you. I will be your God. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the earth. The very fact that he's calling through his word says, I'm here. Amen? The very fact that he just speaks to us through his word today says, I'm here calling you. That's my grace. Because I see you in a situation, I'm merciful, I have pity on you, and I'm ready to help you. That's God. So if you hear his voice today, don't harden your heart, but respond, reflect. Lord, here I am. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we come before you this, this morning. We just want to say thank you for your word. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your goodness. Father, as you extend in your mercy and your love an invitation to us to return unto you, Lord, I ask you for your spirit to remain and abide with us. Please. Help us to reflect, to really think about where we are today, our lives, my life. Lord, help us to remember why you called us out of Babylon in the first place, why you called us to leave all of those things. Please help us to remember that it's about you, about living completely and totally for you, then all of the things that we have chained ourselves to and brought upon ourselves and brought burdens upon ourselves, which you never intended for us to have. Father, in your mercy, can you please break those bonds and help us to let go of those burdens and bring them at your feet and walk with you. Abide with us today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.